Hi, uh, welcome to Snakes on Airplane Mode or Embedding Python in iOS applications. I usually say I'm Wukash, I come from the internet, but since Ireland is essentially a Polish colony right now, uh, like I'm from Poznań, which is in the western part of Poland, um, I invite you to visit, it's nice. Mm. Back in 2019, I went to London to give a keynote about uh, how Python should not only be used for data science, it should be used in more ways, like this Pew Pew console that uh, like I was using back then, uh, I got it from Radomi, and in fact you could use it on this very conference at a workshop earlier in the week. Uh, but I also talked about like WebAssembly, which is happening now, and like mobile devices, which we're gonna make work now as well. So um, what do I mean by, you know, actually embedding, and why do we even want this? Like this talk is going to go through all of this. We're gonna begin with just, you know, kind of appreciating Swift, the language that uh, iOS developers do use for uh, development uh, as a kind of first class language. Then we're gonna say like, okay, so if you have Swift, then like, why would you even want Python uh, there too? Uh, and if you want it, like, how would you actually make it to build so that Apple will be fine with it running on an embedded device, on an iOS device? And if you already have it, compiled such that it does work, we're gonna talk about like how to actually use it from within the iOS app. And finally, we're gonna actually run some code for you to actually believe that this is all actually practically useful. Uh, before we begin, like a question I already got asked at the conference since this is the last day and we've been here for a while, like it's like, why would you actually want this? You know, the App Store like has Swift, and it had Objective-C before. So sure, like Objective-C has been with us since 84, uh, and it's been used uh, for iOS applications, like, you know, pretty much like from day one when um, the SDK was released. Um, it's been the language of the year in 2011 and 2012, and this is because of iOS. Um, like back then, there were um, like, a three quarters of a million apps in the App Store, which ended up paying out uh, over $7 billion to developers. So, you know, it was like two thirds of the market for uh, mobile applications were iOS. So everybody was like crazy about Objective-C. Only later they found out, you know, when they were actually trying to make those apps that they crash a lot and it's kind of awkward to write them because the syntax is very unfamiliar and whatnot and whatnot. So Apple saw that they're, they're hitting a wall with adoption through Objective-C being kind of like a legacy language. They tried to uh, kind of make it more modern with Objective-C 2.0, which garbage collection that was later kind of um, deprecated because it worked kind of lousily on uh, mobile devices but it turned out not to be the way. So they released uh, Swift in 2014. And like four years later, it already overtook Objective-C uh, with adoption. So like apparently they did something right. Like it was the most loved programming language dubbed by the Stack Overflow dev uh, Developer Survey in 2015 and second place in 2016. Uh, clearly only possible because Python was struggling with the 2.223 uh, 2 to 3, uh, transition then. But you know, still we have to give it to them that you know, most loved programming language. Um, and you know, redmonk.com uh, says that in a world in which it's incredibly difficult to break into the top 25 of language rank rankings, let alone the top 10, Swift managed the chore in less than four years. It remains a growth phenomenon. Okay, so clearly they did something right there. But obviously when we're looking at this chart, we're mostly interested in this. We're at a Python conference, we're the first here like yes, uh, language of the year, 2007, 2010, 2018, 2020, 2021, and good chance of doing it again for 2022. In fact, like the top four languages there like have like nearly 50% adoption. So, you know, kind of we're there, we're winning. So maybe we should just upseat, you know, um, Swift and just kind of start doing mobile applications um, that way. Well, I don't believe that. I think uh, that Swift as the language of choice by Apple and make, uh, made kind of the official platform tooling is always going to be better than using something that is third party and 
tries to play catch up and like, you know, make stuff magically work on multiple platforms. Yes, there are multiple options for this. There's React Native, there's Flutter, um, there's um, Beware that um, the Python community is working on. But I personally, just my personal opinion, think that, you know, you should be using the best tool at your disposal. Uh, so why do we even have this talk then? Well, because I'm a heavy note, note taker. Like I have like thousands of notes on my phone, like they're synchronized to my Mac and I do a bunch of things with them, including like publishing my website. And you know, there's a bunch of automation that I do all the time and I'm able to do it on the Mac because I just run the Excel Python, but I cannot do any of this on the phone and it's annoying because I already have those Python scripts. Usually they're not even like NumPy, you know, natural language processing stuff. It's just regular boring Python like that uses the standard library and I still cannot use this. So I found that there was an app on the app store that allowed me to use Python to, you know, model workflows like IFTTT, you know, and kind of write small scripts. But it turns out like this was Python 2 and this is no longer maintained, so it was like a kind of like a bummer. I saw like what is this developer doing now? So oh they're doing Pythonista. This is like an entire IDE that is running on your phone where you can do like mini apps and you know kind of run them within Pythonista, but they can be graphical, they can interact with the uh, operating system, you can have like widgets and whatever. Like it's like, okay, that's cool. Also not maintained for like three years now. So I was looking at an alternative, and Emma Cole uh, worked on, and still works on, Pyto, which is sort of like Pythonista, uh, but actually maintained, like, and pretty powerful. Like, on the website, you can see, you know, that it allows for running Python 3.10, which is awesome. Like, you know, an actual modern version of Python, you can run this. It includes NumPy, Matplotlib, and whatever. This is paid, which I kind of agree with her. Like, you know, it, this entire Pyto app is open source, so you can kind of download it and, you know, try it for, uh, on your own, but if you want to have like include libraries and a bunch of other things, like you know, this is a paid on uh, on, on the app store. Like the re the reason why is that if it w were in the case, you would have like tens of copycat apps that do exactly the same, and then you know it's a support nightmare for the actual author. So open source is kind of you know um, we want it, but at the same time, like people don't play the game fair all the time. So the fact that part of it is is paid is good by me, but you know. Plenty of awesome features. But again, this is not what I wanted. I just wanted a text editor to be able to automate it. Like I didn't want to write my text editor within Python and just run it as a Python mini app. Like that's, that's not what I, what I wanted. Uh, back when my haircut was kind of quite different, like I actually was saying that Python is runnable pseudocode. Like you know, 13 year olds can uh, program it. So this is what I wanted to do. To let people write Swift apps that are um, modern that are first class on iOS, but allow people, allow users to extend them, to customize them, right? Like, and is this something that anybody is doing? Well, as far as I can tell, not on iOS, but in the, uh, in the world of desktop applications, that is a tremendously popular thing to do. You have like Blender, right? Which is, you know, kind of industry grade 3D modeling software and it has a Python API, right? You have a bespoke synth, like a modular synthesizer that can be scripted with Python. You can just make it play notes uh, generatively and whatever. Uh, if you're a YouTuber or an aspiring YouTuber, you know OBS and that thing can also be scripted by Python. So, you know, all of this is pretty popular. In fact, even production grade digital audio workstations like FL Studio here can be programmed with Python. So clearly the market is there. People want this since like supporting um, multi-platform Python embedding is not an easy job. Uh, so the fact that uh, all those pieces of software, industry grade pieces of software, not toys, like actual professionals use them, the fact that they want um, Python APIs there means that this is something that the users are uh, actually well, wanting. So, should we actually unseat Swift? No, we should make Swift talk to Python and, you know, uh, the vice versa. So this is what we are gonna do next uh, in practice, in life, because we live dangerously. Uh, we'll be using Beware's Python 3.11 for iOS uh, scripting, so like, you know, kind of set up, um, since Python 3.11 does not build cleanly on iOS. Uh, I wish we're not there yet, 
uh, we will be there at some point. I do hope to work with Beware to make 3.12 um, pretty much um, compile for iOS with no changes. So uh, we'll see. As a developer in residence, I think you know I'm, I'm well positioned to actually make this happen. Uh, we will be using Python Kit to talk from Swift to Python and vice versa. Uh, that was originally created for Swift for TensorFlow. That was a, an attempt to replace Python in TensorFlow with Swift. And this is now a project that was canceled. So clearly, again, use the best tool for the job. Turns out that Python is the best tool for orchestrating machine learning. Um, Swift tried to unseat that, didn't work. Uh, but we will be using Swift UI, which is the kind of latest and greatest in uh, creating uh, mobile applications for iOS. The fun fact about this is that there's not going to be any Objective C inside. So before we actually look at code, Beware. Beware tries to make uh, Python applications run on mobile in ways where you write a single uh, code base and you can ru run it on Android and on iOS uh, with pretty much no changes. Um, and there's also like a Linux uh, port so you can run it on desktop as well. We're not going to be using Beware today. We're going to be using like a support element of Beware which allows to Python, the programming language, be built uh, in a way that can be embedded inside an iPhone application. Uh, so what is this Python Apple support thing? Like, why do we need it? Well, it is a gigantic patch file that makes tiny changes to, many tiny changes to Python, such that we can actually compile it uh, with Clang on, on Xcode and make it uh, embed. Uh, but it's also like a make file that is like a thousand li lines long that uh, kind of provides like a, a ton of steps that you know have to be made for the actual artifact to be acceptable by Xcode. So with having all this in mind, demo time. Cool. So, uh, oh, before we begin, let me show you something cool. All uh, the things that we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be doing in, in memory because I have 64 gigs, so why, why use disk? Um, so let's switch to RAM disk. CPython, no, we're not going to be working on CPython now. I mostly have it to, to, to run CPython because you can compile it in like eight seconds in RAM. Uh, but now we're just going to clone an app that I wrote uh, in Swift UI. We're going to talk about it in a second, so let's go there, uh, see what we have here. Okay, so let's just open this Bullseye Xcode project. Okay, we have an Xcode application. It is a very, very simple Swift UI application. Um, it's got an app object, which you can see that there's literally just some state, you know, we call it a game, and there's a single content view, like a single window and a single sheet for like a leaderboard. So like very simple. There's a bunch of views, but it's only because, you know, it's like in HTML, you have a bunch of components that are like just nested uh, inside one another. So we're just switching them like, you know, uh, splitting them into multiple files just so that this file, the main file, doesn't look terrible. Um, in Xcode, you can actually see the preview of it. So let's wait until this builds. And in a, in a moment, we should see, yeah, this is like, the, the, the smallest thing you can call a game, so you know, it's like put the bullseye as close to the number 19. So you literally put the slider as close to 19, click hit me, and like if, if you got 19, you get like many points. If you got 90, you, you're gonna get less points because it wanted 19. Um, yeah, so like very simple application, but it already kind of, this is Swift UI, so it's, it's proper iOS, so like it works, you know, in both orientations, it will work in dark mode as well, which we can actually check here, like by switching to the dark, you know, uh, and back and whatever. So yeah, like all of this kind of works very nicely. Uh, this isn't even the simulator. Uh, well, you can obviously run the entire application in a simulator. I have my phone connected, it's called Lucky 13 because it's an iPhone 13 mini and I'm lucky because minis are just well shaped for my hands. But now let's just use the oldest device that can actually run this. So a simulator of I I iPod Touch, which I don't believe they sell anymore, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, so this is gonna take a while, and then the simulator is going to hopefully show us something. It doesn't show us yet. Okay, so we can, you know, kind of attempt to, oh, 14, maybe here, I don't know. 15, okay, so we got 149 points, awesome. And now we're in round two, we can do five, so five is gonna be closer. Okay, five, 
Oh, 200 points because I perfect, you know, bullseye. Amazing. <laughs> that was not scripted. Uh, that's just my talent. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it has like a leaderboard. Obviously, it's stupid. You know, you don't log in, you don't do anything. But like, it just shows you like there's a, there's a card that you can swipe out. You know, it's like this is like a modern Switch UI app. It doesn't have like many lines of code. You can reset your progress if you don't like to have many points. You can just start over. That, that's, that's the thing. That's the app. Like, it's, it's, it's not very complicated. What we will want to do is to replace this logic that like calculates the points with Python, right? So this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, so let's stop the simulator. Uh, in fact, like before we even do anything else, like let's try to run it on the phone so that I'm sure that actually it does run, because uh, it would be awkward like in a minute when if it wouldn't. Uh, but it should be fine. So build succeeded, and it says running. But can we see it? Well, I, I hope we can. Uh, look, this is my phone from QuickTime Player, so you can actually see me manipulating the phone, right? Like, and it actually does a thing. To prove you that this is actually the phone, like this is the phone. Connect, don't message me now. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I don't trust him not to do it. So let's put focus. Do not disturb. <laughs> okay, yeah. So this is my actual phone, like, and, and we're running this app, right? So like, it's a pretty nice developer experience. We're gonna put Python there. The reason why I'm so like, you know, insistent on like, oh look, this is the UI, this is the simulator, this is the device, is that all three steps fail running Python in different ways. So I can show you that we can actually run it in all three scenarios, which is important if you actually want to develop applications later. Okay, so let's stop the application right now and put our uh, Python thing in it. Uh, oh no, this is too small. So let's just change to this directory where I was before, which was this, uh, Python Apple support. Uh, let me show you what's in it. Uh, I, I see it on the wrong screen, but here it is. So it's essentially uh, this make file and everything, and it has a bunch of distribution files that we will be literally dragging and dropping into, uh, into our Xcode project. So let's do it right now. Uh, oh, or maybe not. Like, let's create some folders so that we organize things as civilized people do. So frameworks. So we're going to put the frameworks that we built. Uh, and also resources, we're gonna uh, put the standard library of Python. So, boom, resources. I can barely see it, but like, okay, hopefully no typos. So frameworks, um, and we want to put those XC frameworks there. There's a bunch of them, it's kinda weird, but you know, like, I'll explain it in a second. So we we're putting it over frameworks. We do want to copy them inside. Uh, if you do that, then GitHub wants you to pay them because now your uh, you know, kind of .a files are gonna be very big and this is no longer free tier of GitHub. So welcome to professional development. This takes a little while to compile because it's like, oh, I don't know what this is. Like it'll resolve it in a, in a moment. Uh, in the meantime, we can add the standard library of Python, which is in this Python folder. You see like resources, lib, Python 3.11. We also want that. We will be using that. So let's, let's add it to resources. Okay. And now, after all those uh, question marks disappeared, we will, um, experience Xcode lying to us many times. This is gonna be a story of failure, but I want you to actually see these failures because if you actually skip a step and end up seeing this, I don't want you to just see the final solution first. I want you to see the failure so like we can actually know like, oh, like this is how this is solved. So now we put Python there. We, we don't use it yet at all, but like, does it build? Uh, we press yes, and it says it does build. It will say that it, it cannot run it because I have my phone locked, but I unlock it, and now it's running. Uh, let me switch to the simulator later. Um, in fact, I want to do it because I want to show you that Python is not at all there yet. So let's switch to iPhone Touch it again. Press play. Build succeeded, awesome, it shows. Cool, uh, how can we see if it's there? There's multiple civilized ways to do it, but we don't have time for that. Uh, so let's see it in the simplest way ever. Xcode allows you to see the build folder in Finder. So we have the build folder again in the wrong screen. Let's uh, bring it here. This we don't need anymore. And you see that, oh, there's a Bullseye app. 
it, it has like a, you know, a, an icon that suggests that it won't run on this computer because it's an iOS app. But we can look inside and we see that the bullseye uh, thing is 700 kilobytes big. Okay, cool. But the Python um, parts, which are like, yeah, the headers we don't need, libpython.a is 70 megs big. So if your application is 700 kilobytes, you, you can pretty much know that nothing happened. Like it, this was actually not included. Like it's, it's, it's not good. Um, by the way, you, you, you can see that those headers, they are needed for Xcode to show us things. But what's actually linked is this .8 file. So clearly, we have to fix something. So uh, well, we should make sure that there's a framework that is actually like included in this app. So is it included? Xcode claims it is. Uh, it listed under frameworks because it, we put it, you know, in, in a nicely called directory, and it looks like a framework, so it lists it. Uh, it says do not embed. We actually don't want to embed because what that would mean is um, dynamically loaded libraries would be embedded inside our application. We have .a files; they should be linked with the binary. Uh, that should end up like a single code object. So we don't want to embed. That's fine. We want to link. Do we link it? In build phases, we should see link binary with libraries, and they're all listed, so they should link. But they're not being linked. Why not? Oh, it turns out that I need help with that from Corey Benfield. Um, if you look in that project, you will see like a lot of headers, you know, so like all those .h files, uh, and among them, the main one that we want is Python uh, Python .h. Uh, if you open it, it will say entry point of the Python C API. This is what people include when they want Python. Um, so we actually do need to say this to the Swift compiler that like, hey, this is the .h file that we, you, uh, you need uh, to uh, look for to embed. So let's make a new file and create a module map. Where's an empty file here? Empty, I just want an empty file. Give me an empty file, please. Oh, empty documentation, markdown, close enough. Uh, so let's, let's put it wh wherever, say bullseye, and, and call it module.module map. Okay, yes, not markdown, dude. Oh, still markdown, okay. Um, we want to have a module called Python, and that module will have an umbrella that's a nice keyword. I like that they have a keyword called umbrella. Um, header, python.h, right? We, all, we, we just look at it. We want to export everything from it. We're greedy. Uh, and we want to link Python. That's it. But we want to put it in a good place. Uh, so let's show this in Finder. There's more Finders. I want to see all of them. OK, frameworks. So those headers need this module map. So let's give it the module map. Uh, what is happening? OK, let's copy this file over here. By the way, all of those things are the things that I hope with 3.11 are going to be just automatic. Um, so, but for now, if you want to actually use this for the next two years, like, this is what you have to do. So this already will run on the device, hopefully. It's a lie, but like, you, know, you can hope. Uh, and then we also have to make it work on the simulator. Uh, by the way, what's fun, uh, you'll see that the simulator's um, lib.a is twice as big. It's because it's a fat library, which runs on both ARM and Intel. So that's good. Uh, the device one doesn't have to have like fat binaries because it's only ARM. Okay, so with this in mind, like that should already fix our problem, right? So let's try to run it. Stop the previous one. Run this one. Build succeeded. It did uh, appear, and this is still. 800 kilobytes, that's not good. And the reason why is that the Swift compiler tries really hard not to link things in if it's not entirely sure it needs them, because otherwise mobile apps would be terribly big uh, and nobody wants to download hundreds of megs over uh, you know, kind of their data roaming in a different country. Uh, so we actually have to, in our app, say import Python. What's this Python? Well, that's exactly this, this thing that we just uh, defined, this module that we just defined. Uh, and we actually have to use it. So we have to define some fake function called please link Python. And here, we, we need to use some part of the C, C API, like pi initialize, say. Like it's, it's how you would initialize like an um, Python interpreter with the C, C API. 
uh, what is the, what does this say? Please link Python. Oh yeah, of course. Cool. So in a minute, like this should disappear. Okay. Now let's try again and see some progress. Oh, progress, errors, that's good. That means like we went somewhere further. What are those errors? There's hundreds of them, but among them you will see that there's like stuff, oh, SQLite is missing. Why didn't viewer add it? Well, because it ships with uh, iOS. You don't have to actually add it again. Like it would be wasteful. Again, your binary would be bigger than it needs to be. So when you, we link stuff, we just need to say we want SQLite in, in iOS, we ship a SQLite version, so let's add it. And let me just already, libz is also needed, so let's add that too. So yeah, TBD, by the way, not to be determined, it's text-based description. I also didn't know what that is. I asked Apple uh, people and they said text-based description. Now we're smart. Okay, cool, let's try it again. Both succeeded, it runs, and now, 12 megs, still smaller, it's weird. Ah, because the Swift compiler is actually smart and like within the binary there's a bunch of like debug symbols and stuff that actually does not link to python.h. So we're not in fact linking those, but we're linking Python now. So this is success. Now we actually have Python inside our simulator. Uh, so we can start doing stuff with it. Um, but what we have right now is this import Python thing that um, exposes uh, the C API of Python, which is super low level. You have like stuff like incrementing and decrementing reference counts and whatever. Like this is not really what you want to do if you're writing in a high level language like Swift. So instead, what can you do? There's a bunch of things for Objective-C, but again, we don't want to use Objective-C. And there's one cool thing for Swift uh, called Python Kit, which uh, originally came from uh, the Swift for TensorFlow project. So we can add it by just saying, we want a dependency. You can also use CocoaPods or uh, Carthage, but like, let's just do it like graphically here. And you say, from GitHub, uh, I already have this here, but you know, it's like, this, this entire link here is add Python kit. So you just paste this entire link here and say, add package. And now conference Wi-Fi will allow me to add the package it did, which is amazing. Uh, and we can see that there's already some code there. It's some cute, like, um, Swift code that does the thing that we wanted, which is, uh, like, converting all the types to Python objects and whatever. We don't need any of, uh, to do any of this. We can just be users. So now, uh, inside, say, our models, right, so this game, uh, class that has just like, you know, what is the number that you should be hitting? What is the current score you have? Which round of the game it is, it, is it now? And so on and so on. Uh, we can start using Python. So before we had this nice function, points, that was written in Swift. Uh, we actually are like, you know, good programmers, so we even wrote tests for it, so we know that uh, if we get like bullseye, we get 200 points. If we get like one off, like we're gonna have 149 because you get 100 extra points for hitting bullseye, 50 if you're within five points. And if you're like very far, you just get as many points as the distance from the perfect score. So we can run the test here with this nice button and instead of line 23. Uh, it'll take a while, but build succeeded and hopefully it's green. Yeah, okay, it's green for now. We're gonna fix this now because uh, green is, is boring. Okay, so uh, let's bring up the game again. So this is Swift points. We don't want Swift, we want Python. And the reason why I wanted uh, to show you this is that this, the, the syntax of using Python inside Swift with Python Kit looks super nice. You actually have to import Python Kit first, so let's do it. Okay, we imported Python Kit. But now what we can do is we can say that we will have random, and random is a Python library that we're just importing. So we imported a Python library, and now inside Swift, we can literally say that we want to say return uh, random rand int, oh, we never give a thousand points in the Swift version, so let's say between a thousand and two thousand, so we know that we're actually running Python. Uh, it will not be happy with us uh, because what is it? Well, rand int returns, uh, which we can check uh, with option click, 
it returns, no, it doesn't return anything. Oh, it, it returns essentially like a Python object, right? So we need to convert it to an end. In fact, like let's see that it's like a result, so you, you'll see what type it is. Yeah, it's a Python object, right? Uh, so we need to convert it to an integer so that um, result, or like let's convert it right here. Int, yeah. And that's almost fine. Like if we put result here, it'll still yell at us because, you know, it's Python. What if, if you don't actually return an int? Well, then there's going to be nil. So you're, you're going to have to say, well, for this particular purpose, we're not going to do try catch or whatever. We're just going to say, yeah, like it'll be int. If it's not int, then the app will crash. Okay, fine. Uh, but this is fine for now for like a short, short talk. Like don't do it in actual applications on the app store. Okay, so now let's see if this actually does anything. Build succeeded. Let me just pr press hit, hit me. And it gives us like thousands of points. This is Python running inside the SwiftUI app. I am already happy with this. This is already cool. And now what we could do is we could keep writing Swift using Python libraries. This is not exactly what we want, right? Like we want to actually write like longer Python pieces of code. Uh, so even though this is cool, let's extend this and just actually create a file inside our resources. Oh, we're going to be calling, say, script UI. Uh, annoyingly, just like recently, Xcode removed support for Python syntax highlighting because of the new parser. So we're going to be left with just like regular black uh, colors here. But yeah, we can do the same thing here. So like we can say import random. Uh, we're going to have like uh, def points that you know there's a guess of int, and you know we're going to be returning an int. And here like we can return what uh, this random rand int thousand to two thousand. It's the same thing, but in a Python module. So okay, like will this work? Like you know, spoiler alert, it won't. Uh, uh, you know, if if you just replace this with script script and say script points uh, script points guess this should ideally work but what will actually happen is something that we know from python which is an import error oh we cannot find the file why well because we never configured where our files are so let's do that if you get import errors uh, you should tell your Python kit uh, where, where your modules live. Usually you don't have to do this when you're using Python kit um, inside um, like Mac applications, which is what Python kit was created for. But for here, you do need to be a little hacky. Like I hope to improve this in Python kit in the future, but for now, you literally have to use some environment variables. We're gonna be doing this, but just as you don't import things inside functions in Python, we don't really want to import things inside a, fu uh, a function here, because what this will do is it will actually instantiate a new interpreter with every call. It's just like super wasteful for your battery and everything. So in instead, let's just say that we are going to have our script, which is a Python object. Everything is a Python object in Python. Uh, and here, we just want to instantiate this. Uh, but uh, no, there's no let anymore. And this indentation is making me crazy. Somebody should write an auto formatter for this. Um, yeah, cool. So what we want to do is uh, to find a directory for Python resources. So you, the way you do it is just to say path is a bundle, which is what you actually have, like this bundle with your app and like all those other files. The main bundle, which is uh, actually what ships. And we want to have a path to a resource, which is path for resource. Uh, and we want to have this Python slash resources directory. It actually wants you to say, well, of which type? So what is the file extension? There is no file extension. Uh, yeah, so if we have this, because like it can also be nil, it might not be fine, uh, found. So if it is actually found, uh, then we want to set it inside the Python path variable. You remember Python path? It's like, you know, days of yours. So, you know, maybe there should be virtual, and no, no virtual environments for this. Okay, so path, yes, and replace whatever you found. So like, yeah, always set it. 
Uh, okay, the, the, this should this should disappear. All is good. Cool. So will this find our application now? It should. If it won't, I will be surprised. Okay. Boom, it found our file again. So now we can actually code here inside the script. You know, we can actually put more code. We can now like do more imports. We can do interesting things. Uh, but again, I set up all this phone thing to show you whether this works on the phone. And like, spoiler alert, this does not yet work on the phone. We're close, but no, not no cigar yet. Uh, so if you actually stop this, and want to run it on Lucky 13, you'll be unlucky for a while. You'll do it, you'll do exactly the same. Uh, yeah, there's warnings, that's fine. Uh, it'll be running, so let me show you that it's, oh, it's not running. Current thread, no Python frame. It's like something is wrong. No module named encodings. This is terrible. Why? Oh, because it look, looks on my phone for this path. This path will never be found on my phone because this is my Dropbox directory on my, uh, on my laptop. Oh, okay, so what we need to do is we need to, and that's in the app, right? No, we were putting the script in the game. Um, yeah, so we need to also set Python home, which is the environment that actually says, what's your prefix? This ideally should be pro programmatically set and not the way we're doing it right now. This is hacky, but it will work for now. And it will work with Python kit so that this is smoother. Uh, for now though, we can actually press uh, play here, you know, and build succeeded, which is good enough. It actually started. Let me show you that there is an app on the phone right now, okay? And if I play around with it, I can actually hit it bad and still get thousands of points and I can hit it, oh, maybe well. Almost, yeah, but see, like, you know, this is, this is the thing, and there's like a leaderboard and whatever, like, you know. So we made it work. Now it works on the simulator and on the device. You can ship this. Apple will accept it in the App Store. It's good. Um, I could go on now if I had more time because, you know, now this is where the interesting stuff happens where you can just start coding in Python. Like, it's, it's awesome. But the talk was about the setup, which took me, like, weeks to actually go through because there's multiple choices for each of the step, which library you want to do, uh, like, build Python 3.11 with, like, because this is 3.11, so you're one of the first people to see 3.11 working on, uh, on a phone. Um, but also, um, like, you know, the thing is, now you can do many, many wonderful things uh, with, uh, with apps. So the, some ideas for this would be, you know, you can make users script their apps, right? So they could like automate some workflows, they could customize their apps, right? They could uh, do like uh, app behavior changes, right? So you can actually plug it inside some Swift code. As you could see, like the Python functions that we had in our script, uh, now can be just called from Swift regularly with a little bit of help so that you convert Python objects into Swift native uh, data types. Arguments from Swift to Python are already automatically converted, which is awesome, but the other way around, you actually have to be explicitly uh, casting, right? So, you know, you can um, do cha changes to app behavior both by the user, but also by yourself. So you could make some stuff like, you know, some bundle uh, of code that you have on your website or whatever and just update it without re-uploading to App Store. Uh, is, this, is this elegant? Maybe, does Apple love this? Probably not, but do people do it? Like, I don't know, <coughs> Facebook? Like, yes, they do. Um, <laughs> smart content templates. So, for example, if I create a new note, but I'm in gym, I could have like a gym score note and it will automatically pre-populate with stuff that I should do today. Uh, or like level definitions in games. Like this is in fact what like Civilization 4 used Python for. Uh, so you know, you could actually just define uh, levels uh, using Python code, which is nicer than just using something uh, that is uh, static. Uh, generative music sequencing, again, like you know, for music, just saying, I want this note to play after this note, wait this much and then play another note. Like plenty of ideas that you now enable users to do because you write an application in a first class language, but you enable scriptability on the user end. Um, so yeah, I could just go on, but I'm out of time, two minutes. So let me just say that what we just accomplished was we ran Python 3.11, which is in beta, uh, that we built ourselves. 
Uh, I didn't actually build it right now because it takes like 15 minutes for like all those Xcode stuff, but like, you know, we use the .aid files by make iOS from Python Apple support by Beware. Uh, inside a Swift UI application on an actual phone, as you could see, with no Objective-C boilerplate needed. So it was all Swift. Um, and this would not be possible without the help of Russell Keith McGee, who made Beware happen. So huge help uh, from his end, like, I love the guy, thanks. Uh, Corey Benfield actually helped me convince the Swift compiler to statically li uh, link libpython.a. Without him, this would be a theoretical talk. This was a practical talk, thanks to Corey, who works at Apple now on Swift on the server side. Um, Ray Wenderlich taught me uh, iOS. Like, those are very good tutorials that you know, are kind of directed towards people who are new to programming, but also are not super annoying to people who already know some other programming language, so recommended. Uh, Pedro Jose Pereira uh, Vieto wrote Python Kit, thanks to him. Uh, Ned Dealey takes care of macOS and Python, including installers that you know, people are using when they are downloading macOS uh, binaries from python.org. Uh, Lawrence Dana helps bootstrap Apple Silicon support that we just used uh, back in Python, uh, C Python 3.9. Uh, so he actually is an, uh, was an Apple employee at the time and you know, contributed this to us. So thanks to him. And Ronald Osseran wrote PyObjective-C, which is kind of the precursor, this granddaddy of you know, uh, connecting uh, Max and uh, Python, uh, and helped bootstrap Apple Silicon support by reviewing and making his own changes as well. So thanks for all of those. My name is Lukas Langa. Thanks for coming. I hope you liked it. Thanks very much, Lucas, for that great talk. Uh, we have two minutes time for questions. So let's see, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, please question. step to the microphone. microphone. Yeah. Hi, great talk. Uh, just a quick question. Your dummy function, um, please link. Python, is that still needed at this point when you've imported the other It stuff? is still needed. Like ideally, we will have like a more elegant way like of forcing linkage, for example, by Python kit actually doing something. Uh, but like you need to convince the Swift compiler that uh, Python is needed. What Python kit is doing, it is actually like just uh, trying to find symbols inside your binary, but dynamically by DLSIM. So within the code of your application, it doesn't look like you need Python.h. So you need to really just force it somehow. Yeah. Can we have the next question, please? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering about uh, if you can uh, pip install uh, things on uh, iOS, and especially the binary uh, package. No, not in this way of embedding. Yes, in Python, but also no. Uh, so th th there's, this is really a long question, so like very short answer. Uh, we could make pip work for Pyth pure Python uh, dependencies so that they could install into some local storage and you could import them with some Python path uh, mangling. That would be possible. For stuff that has any binary packages, you need to either compile the uh, dynamic libraries yourself because you need to sign them yourself. Otherwise, iOS won't enable you to, uh, you know, kind of load the dynamic library. You will have to do it yourself, uh, or just actually include it in the static binary, as Python is doing. Python is also including everything inside a single binary because it's just kind of, uh, it, it's it's more, I don't know, like it's 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 a sure way that like the thing will work. So yes, like iOS now allows you for dynamic libraries, but you need to sign them yourself. So wheels from PyPI, they cannot work because they're signed by somebody else, or as is the case now, they're not signed by anybody. Thank you. Thank you. And we can do another short question. It's very impressive to see Python running on iOS. Um, do you know what the performance is like compared to running on, say, uh, MacOS uh, laptop silicon? Yeah, uh, performance is better than on Intel Macs. It is weird, but like um, M1 in particular, but also like those like A processors that are pre predecessors of M1 is very highly optimized for automatic reference counting, which is part of Swift. And it just so happens that Python also uses reference counting everywhere. So like for some reason, like Python is pretty quick there. Obviously it is like an order of magnitude slower than Swift because it is using an interpreter loop to interpret your code in real time. That is kind of the point because we are providing this code on the user level, right? Like we could make like an edit box and the code could be literally provided by the user. Um, 
but it's still faster than Intel Max. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty impressive. That's very great. Thank you. So thank you very much. That's all the time we have now. Please give another round of applause to Lukas.